Uh, while Herb was talking, uh, I was thinking about why do we now think of cybersecurity as its own academic field. And Martin and I at the Naval Academy went through this debate. Uh, and one of the arguments that we used was that the Naval Academy has a department of uh, uh, maritime naval architecture. They're the people who design ships. And the question we had is, do you let the people who design ships fight them? The answer, of course, is no. So cybersecurity is its own academic field, and we are in some ways feeling out the contours of it. And in the same way, uh, if you were to go back uh, about a century ago, a little more, um, you could think of the airplane. And when the airplane was first shown to the supreme commander of uh, Allied forces in World War I, he said that it would make a really good replacement for the bicycle, right? Now that was in 1913, and after some experimentation, we know that it was a little bit more than a bicycle. And so now we're in the same period of experimentation, not only academically, how do we define this field as a field of study, but how do we define it as a field of military activity? And it's a good lead-in from Herb's talk to go to Martin Lubicki, my colleague at the Naval Academy, who will talk about where does Cyber Command fit in. It's interesting because the U.S. has three agencies that can engage in cyber attack. And one you all know, uh, NSA. Another one you shouldn't be surprised at, it's CIA. But they operate under different authorities. And so Martin will talk about the military command responsible for this. Martin, please. Okay, thank you. Um, just out of curiosity, before I start speaking, first of all, can you hear me in the back? Yes. I, I, you guys are friends. I know. The rest of you. Okay, good. <laughs> Second question. How many math majors are there, are there here? Okay. Some of you will kind of recognize my style here, as my wife often says. All, this stuff often looks like a math proof. So, go on to this. Okay, when I learned to operate my machinery. Herb actually did a pretty good lead-in for my talk because he talked about Cybercom, he talked about the role of Cybercom, he talked about the position of Cybercom, and to repeat what he said, right now, since 2009, up through the present, Cybercom is a sub-unified command. It reports to the U.S. Strategic Command, who frankly could not care less about matters cyber if it wasn't in his job description because he really likes playing with nuclear and space stuff. And it is joined at the hip to NSA, which makes some people in NSA happy and some people in NSA less happy. Well, there are proposals to do both, to separate Cybercom from NSA. In other words, we have a separate director of Cybercom and a separate commander of the US Cyber Command, and to take Cybercom out from the US Strategic Command. OK? Just want to make sure I don't stand in anybody's way. Um, and if you look at the reasons for this, they're mostly bureaucratic. And if you don't work in the Pentagon or at Fort Meade, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense to you. So I won't go over them. But I am going to start off with a proposition. Where you want Cybercom, how it aligns to other instruments of military power, has everything to do with what you expect it to do as a living as its primary focus. Now, Cybercom has offensive and defensive responsibilities. I'm going to concentrate purely on the offensive ones. And I'm also going to assume that offensive cyber operations can actually do something efficacious. If you disagree with me, you might disagree with me, in which case you can sort of sleep to the next uh, 14 and a half minutes. OK, and the last question, why should an international audience care? Um, we'll just go on from there. OK. Four possible options for offensive cyber operations. First one is tactical. In other words, to support war fighting carrying out what in the United States is called kinetic operations, the use of force, violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The second one is gray zone conflict, otherwise known as hybrid conflict. The third one is information operations. And the fourth one is strategic. Now, in going through. Each of these various options, I'm going to basically ask the question, who are the, who are the hackers playing with? Okay? And if it turns out that the hackers are playing with, for instance, the special operators, then you have a prima facie case for thinking about an organization that puts the hackers and the special operators together. Okay? But 
not all of these missions are going to involve all of the same colleagues. So let's start with tactical operations, okay? Tactical focus, uh, concentrating to a large extent, not exclusively on taking apart opposition command and control. First case I would like to make is if you're serious about Cybercom in a tactical position, you have to think about aligning it with electronic warfare. And let me give you a short math proof because I'm a math major and that's how I think about these things, right? A command and control system is a graph. Graph has nodes and links. Nodes can be taken care of through cyber warfare. Links can be taken care of for electronic warfare. Okay? Easy proof. QED. Now let's go on. Okay? More controversially, cyber operations would be aligned with signals intelligence, which is to say cyber espionage in this particular case. Okay, if you take a look at the structure of US law, Title 10 military, Title 10 espionage, Title 50 espionage, okay? So we tend to think of them as two separate operations. And then I read a story that was in an online journal by Fred Kaplan, who's also written a book about cyberspace. And I don't know if the story is true or not, but it doesn't matter for the purposes I'm going to use it for. Okay? And according to this story, hackers got into the Islamic State's machines and basically faked an order telling the Islamic State warriors to meet at a particular position. Okay? When they got there, U.S. operators were there ahead of time and were able to conduct a very successful military operation against it, okay? Because they were able to fake the command and control orders of the other side. Now let me give you a slightly different scenario, okay? Instead of actually faking commands, they were listening to the commands. And when they found out that there was going to be a meeting of warfighters, they got there a few hours ahead of time with the same results. Now, there are some subtle differences between the two. But in the main, okay, making things happen and listening to things about to happen aren't so different. Let me give you another example. There's been not very good, not a lot of information that's come out about Russian cyber operations in Ukraine. But there was a report by CrowdStrike, which is a U.S. cybersecurity company, that made the argument that the Russians had developed a piece of malware for Android phones that was triggered when these Android phones were used for counter for, for basically artillery targeting, okay? Uh, it, it used the GPS of the phones, it led to greater accuracy, but every time they turned on that application, it broadcast the location of these Ukrainian forces to Russian forces, which then went ahead and sort of took military action against them. Technically, espionage. Practically, probably more effective than simply blowing up their phones, which would have been an act of cyber war. So the distinctions between collecting information and destroying information or altering information are distinctions that make more sense in law than they actually do in the field. Okay, what happens if we go down this road? Well, if you want to put tactical cyber espionage together with cyber command, what do you do with strategic cyber espionage, which doesn't belong in cyber command? What do you do with those guys who listen to foreign leaders and tell the president what the uh, premier, what the, what the president of Russia is doing, for instance, okay? Where do you make that split? Second of all, even though cyber operations tend to be logically targeted after military targets, it's a fact of life that military targets are generally harder than civilian ones, which means you do have to do more investment and you may not get good results. Okay, gray zone focus. If you're comparing, I have to do something, am I gonna use it, do a cyber attack, or am I gonna do a kinetic attack? There are a lot of reasons to favor one over the other. But there may be situations under which so cyber attacks are possible and kinetic attacks are simply off the table. In other words, when you're in hybrid warfare situations, gray zone situations, the relative, of si relative attractiveness of cyber attacks goes up. And because it goes up, that may be where you actually want to concentrate your cyber attacks on and therefore concentrate your cybercom capability on, okay? So we talked about cyber attacks not as being loud but as covert, even clandestine. Okay. Is this a good basis on which to organize Cyber Command? Here's the problem. As Jim pointed out, we already have a, co a clandestine service. And we know that clandestine service uses cyber attack tools. 
So do we really need Cybercom to do what that clandestine service does? And it's not clear that the answer is yes. Okay, this is a little more complicated focus. Okay, it basically says, look, a lot of things that used to be lumped under informational operations are actually fairly similar. Cyber attack is like EW, has similarities in psychological operations, uh, basically is similar to weaponized surveillance, device hijackings, okay? Now, why would you want to use them all together? I would argue that the reason that they fit in the same niche is because they have a lot of similar characteristics. They are non-lethal. The effects may be far too unpredictable for combat use. They are often ambiguous in origin, and they have a persistent generation capability. Uh, even to the point where a country's hackers can survive the, the mice of a country's government, at least for a certain amount of time. Because they have their, they share the similar niche, you can, one can understand why you might want to use them under the same circumstances. And it gets you to the next question. If you're going to use them under the same circumstances, why don't you do the planning of their use by the same organization, sort of a collectivity, okay? So, this is the argument, in fact, it was written up in Strategic Studies Quarterly about six months ago about the logic for thinking of cyber attacks and cyber espionage as part of an integrated operation. But, there are issues. Propaganda and information warfare on facts comes naturally to some countries that I won't mention out loud than it does to other countries, okay? And the second is, if you actually have an overall information operations orientation of Cybercom, you probably want to put somebody who understands psychological operations on, as the head of it, who will then thereby have, thereby have a much tougher time managing what is otherwise a highly technical organization. So, some issues here. And finally, I'm gonna go to the strategic focus. And the strategic focus basically is, you use cyber attacks as part of your overall deterrence and compulsion policy. Which, oh by the way, gets you right back to, to strategic command, okay? In other words, if we want to influence a nation's behavior, we influence their behavior by presenting them with an overall integrated threat against them. And that integrated threat goes all the way from nuclear warfare on one side to information warfare on the other side, um, depending on the circumstances under which you'd want to use the threat. Now, for instance, if you look at the Russian use of tactical nuclear weapons in threat postures, you can already see this logic taking hold. But for the United States, we tend to be a lot quieter about our use of nuclear weapons. We generally don't have as overt a compulsion policy using nuclear tools as we could have and as other countries do. And when we do want to compel, other countries to do what we want them to do, we generally use civilian agencies. We give them the threat of sanctions. We give them the threat of judicial action. And at least in the Obama administration, that's been the primary instrument, okay? So then you're left with the dilemma of whether you put Cybercom under Treasury or Justice Department, and that's an absolute non-starter, so you have a disjunction over here. Okay, so what am I sort of concluding, other than I am thinking out loud and I am forcing you folks to actually sit through the thinking. Okay. One is there is no obvious basis for the organization of Cybercom because a lot depends on the relationship between how you want to use cyber attacks in the pursuit of national policy and the particular vectors through which national policy operates. If I had to make a guess, and the operative word here is guess, I would say that the tactical missions of Cybercom should have the highest importance, followed by information operations, gray zone operations, strategic operations, okay? But that's subject to circumstances. It's also, by the way, subject to the character of the commander in chief. Because different commanders in chief will have different instruments for expressing national power. But these first three all of them tend to put electronic warfare, tactical cyber espionage, and cyber operations under the same roof. And if you take a look at other countries, you can see them sort of evolving to that standard. And these other countries, as best as I understand, include China, 
which has formed the Strategic Support Force, which has that sort of, those elements in it, howsoever well integrated. From what I understand, and I might be, I may be wrong on this, I get the impression Germany is going down that route. And I also get the impression that it's a strong element in how Israel organizes its armed forces. So, like many things that I advocate, I don't really expect this to take place, okay? But I would argue that, that, that before we rush in and say that we've made up our mind, we the United States, have made up my, my, our mind about the place of cyber attacks, perhaps some fundamental thinking about what we want to use them for would not be remiss. Thank you.